thrilled that you're willing to take the time to uh, come out on a freaking bitter cold day. <laughs> you can that in there too. Yeah. The freaking part. <laughs> We got to be authentic, right? That's the name <laughs> of the game here. So you have been, so you're the downtown development coordinator for the city of Dayton, and you've been in that role or related roles for a long time. We're not going to say numbers. A lot um, of years, yes. Um, okay. 11 years? <laughs> a lot of years. A lot of years. More than 11. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, honey, I think it's been longer than that. And this project we're in the what was known as the Dayton Arcade. It's now partly known as the hub. It's, there's a lot of other moving pieces and parts right. within this. This is a massive, massive undertaking. Yeah. And it's been a massive undertaking pretty much from the jump. So because you know this better than darn near anybody in the universe, can you kind of lay out the scope of the initiative for us? How many buildings? How much square feet if you yeah. know that off the top of your head you probably do but just give people a sense of just how huge this project was yeah so th this building um you know it, it got a start in the early 1900s and it was an arcade like you would find in other cities where it was a place of commerce where there would be the farmer's market and the meat cutter and and uh different things like that a little bit of, of dining uh casual dining I'm talking about right uh, that all happened in here in the early 1900s as other buildings were uh constructed around the arcade so the uh, arcade and well we'll we'll show yeah. some images of this but the arcade is a, a circular right um open atrium right with a glass with a glass roof so there's mm -hmm. great daylighting in it even with all the buildings that blanket it now it gets great daylight uh, and, and that part is awesome. So anyway, through the early 1900s and mid 1900s, um, this was a place of commerce, a place of retail, because that's where people did their retailing. Mm -hmm. It's before the Federal Highway Act of 1954 that be great, began sprawl in the United States. So people came downtown to do pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. uh, that, of course, faded with uh, the highways and, and uh, you know, just sprawl. Sprawl. development. Yes. Yeah, suburban development uh so the, in the 1980s i actually moved to dayton in the late 1980s mm. and i uh went to school uh at a nearby university and rode the bus and always came to the dayton arcade i fell in love with the dayton arcade before i even knew i should uh, <laughs> but uh it closed then in the early 1990s mm. again because of that competition with other uh retail uh, establishments, uh, the conglomeration of retail uh, in exurban and suburban areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, people didn't come down to retail. People came down to work in the 80s and early 90s. It wasn't a, a place uh, where you played to. You just worked. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, especially in the late 90s and then into early 2000, uh, cities, especially uh, tertiary cities like Dayton, uh, really came to understand that you can't just be a one-legged stool. You have to have at least three legs on your stool, and it has to be live, work, and play. And mm -hmm. we've added learn to that. So we are live, learn, live, learn, work, and play. And we're not and working. <laughs> yeah, we could learn too. <laughs> uh, so all those have to, uh, you know, all those different things have to happen in order for there to be be by a vibrancy, mm -hmm. a quote quotient that people can react to and respond to. There has to be enough there for people to yeah. be justified to, like it's worth going. Yeah, worth going. Like, I want to be able to park once and take in these different experiences. So anyway, in the late 19, in, in sorry, in the early two, 2000s, um, this building went dormant. Mm. Uh, it was sold off to uh, a nonprofit. Well, I, don't, I don't even remember all the different hands that it went through. But mm -hmm. basically, it was dormant. And there were a lot of false starts with people interested in starting a redevelopment here. But with 500, over 500,000 square feet in a series of interconnected buildings, it's hard to get all that programmed so that the whole thing would work. So just to be clear, we're talking half a million square feet, more than half a million square feet under multiple roofs, multiple buildings built over... A few decades, right? That all are connected to each other, but not necessarily 
in a nice, neat, organized fashion. And nobody could figure out how to make this work. Right. Yeah, that, that's exa- exa- exactly true. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, and if you in development, you know that the pre-development trajectory is longer than the construction phase. Mm-hmm. And the, the arcade is no exception. And pre-development in, meaning what are we going to do with it? How are we going to fund it? Yeah. How are we going to pay for it? And um, how are we going to operate it long term? How are we going to make this work yeah. for more than six months? Right. Kind of complicated and yeah. kind of important questions. Yeah. So fast forward, uh, you know, there were years of its being dormant. Uh, at the same time of, of all the years being dormant, the people that had been in the building continued to decline because we're all getting older. Mm-hmm. And young people hadn't been in this building before because why it, it had been closed. So generating interest in its redevelopment and then finding a developer interested in taking on the giant that this building is, or the series of buildings is, is you know, was a, a wow. long play. And it, you know, it's not done yet. And yeah. Again, it's not about just getting it, it done. It's about making it operating, uh, making it operate and operate in a sustainable way so that you have you know, cost of flow of tenants, cost of flow of income, and the maintenance is being taken care of. Yep. So all yep. that's important. Getting it done is important. But then uh, the basement of the arcade is area called the tank. And it's uh, like a theater in the round. And there's pitch competitions that happen down there. And then singer songwriter set that happen oh. there. And then educational, uh, different educational sessions. And people have even had parties down there. If you don't want to have a party in the main part of the arcade, which is huge, mm-hmm. and you know, if you're only going to have a hundred guests or maybe less than that, maybe if you're only going to have 50 guests, you're not going to fill up that space in a meaningful way. So there's other spaces for you to, you know, wonderful, have your recreation and parties. So we have arts, we have visual arts, we have performing arts, yes, we have living, we have apartments. We have um, retail. Yes. We have education. Education. We haven't talked about the relationship with the University of Dayton. Right. Which plays a huge role in this this area where we're sitting particularly. Yeah. Yeah. The other part that we haven't talked about either, and certainly you'll see that on the nameplates of, of some of the tenants here, is, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that either have full-time spots here or get day passes so they can be around other people and mm-hmm. uh, collide and collaborate on uh, different things that make, you know, th- the entrepreneurial economy uh, propel forward. So we haven't talked about that. And I think this is a great place, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're operating out of your bedroom or your garage or, you know, maybe your couch. This is a next step up for you to build whatever it is that you're, you know, mm-hmm. trying to put together. And then our hope, you know, from the city of Dayton's perspective is that, you know, when you graduate out of the Entrepreneur Center, which this uh, por- portion of the building that we're in right now is operated by the Entrepreneur Center, which is a, a collaborative with the city of Dayton, Dayton Development Coalition, Montgomery County, all pitch money in together to operate this. And the university. And the University of Dayton is also part of it. There's probably a lot of partners. I'm, I, I don't want to slate any partners, <laughs> but there's a lot of partners. Uh, she that, that. she doesn't have a she doesn't have a screen running with all of the three hundred names. <laughs> yeah, true. SBDC is in here. You know, there there's a and lot. That's, of, a, that's the federal small, small business, business development, development center. Yeah, I forget. I don't know who your audience is, but yeah. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of partners that make all this work, and them being yeah. here close to each other and knowing, okay, if I need, uh, I'm going to have to do my taxes. Let me find mm-hmm. out who can help me with that. This mm-hmm. is a great resource mm-hmm. for that. So let's go back to the university. The university uh, in 20, I'm guessing 2019, that's when Cross Street Partners committed to the project was in 2020. Well, as part of them making a commitment, they had to have some pre-development leases kind of like they had to know that they were going to have some bigger tenants. The university was one of them that came in early and obviously has classrooms down here. It has a presence here with the Regional Transit Authority. There is a commuter uh, loop bus that runs between here and the university to bring students back and forth. So it kind of uh, makes the whole thing about downtown parking makes it away. more of a flow. Yeah. yeah. And, and anybody can get on that circulator and go, you know, where the circulator goes. And it's free for everyone. It's obviously uh, stood up or made possible 
uh, through a partnership with RTA, uh, the building here, and I think University of Dayton, and then there's other downtown partners that have uh, paid to make that go. But that that helps uh, a lot of people not as comfortable being downtown get worried about parking. Parking is not a problem, and we have an excess of parking since COVID <laughs> uh, in our downtown. But yeah. still, being able to do that, uh, you know, park somewhere else and take the bus in, it just alleviates that until people sure. get used to, oh, yeah, there's the parking garage right there. Let me just go there. That's easy. Or I'm only going to be 20 minutes, so I'll just take this metered spot here and know I can, you know, stay there for an hour. So yeah. anyway, a lot of different opportunities uh, to make people feel more comfortable with being and engaging with our downtown. Yeah. And one of the things that I've, that I've particularly noticed, a lot of times when I've been here, it's been for a launch date event. And launch date yeah. is the, you know, the collaborative of all of the organizations in Dayton that are involved in entrepreneurship, startup, small uh-huh. business. And two things that have struck me here, particularly, one is that they've done a very good job for a city of this size of doing startup events. So, so startup week here is very well attended uh-huh. and it's not just a little pejorative sounding, <laughs> but it's not just tech bros. No, it's not. So it, it, it's, it it's a very, very inclusive community. Yeah. It, it's evolved over time. And Scott Korndike runs the entrepreneur center here mm-hmm. in Dayton. And every year I come, oh, you know, I come over for, you know, some of, some of the sessions and just to see how much the faces in the crowd have changed and how many people identify as entrepreneurs because, you know, right. it used to be the only people that were entrepreneurs were what you called the tech bros. But now entrepreneurs- there's a few tech girls in there, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the entrepreneurs come in all shapes, sizes, right. uh, ideas, and it really makes my heart flutter. And a lot, you, you talk about Launch Dayton. One of my New Year's resolutions is they have a great storytelling aspect to Launch Dayton. And I uh, really encourage people to sign up for their regular newsletters uh, because my New Year's resolution is to each month explore or purchase something mm-hmm. or visit one of the businesses that is highlighted in Launch Dayton's uh, monthly. And yeah. I have my first visit with one of the businesses. I'm going to their business. Uh, it's actually next next Thursday. So that's awesome. uh, part of my 2024 awesome. plan is I'm going to, you know, seek out these entrepreneurs, Great. And try to, uh, you know, obviously help their bottom line, but also get to know them as humans. Too. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. I actually have a colleague who did some research that indicated that downtown Dayton has the largest concentration. I may be getting this a little bit wrong, but I'm in the neighborhood. The largest concentration of black owned businesses in the central business district for for downtown Dayton, largest of its size in the I believe in the country. Oh wow. And I'll double check that and yeah. we'll, we'll we'll make sure that's accurate. I'm I'm not familiar with that uh statistic, but you know, just with the city receiving a lot of ARPA funds, uh we put So a, that's a COVID, COVID oh, yeah, COVID. funding. Uh we put a lot of focus on helping entrepreneurs and startups, especially uh, the populations that were most negatively affected by COVID. Yeah. And we developed what's called a first floor fund that's funded by the city of Dayton and then operated and administrated by a uh, citywide development corporation. Oh, okay. And there's been a great uptick in uh, entrepreneurs in restaurant, retail, uh, nighttime establishments that have emerged uh, yeah. because of that uh, loan grant. It's a loan grant combination. So we okay. see great success. It's not just in our downtown. We really wanted uh, that uh, COVID relief money to, to stretch into our neighborhoods. Yeah. So that money is available on our, on our corridors as well. So great. I, I know we're here to talk about the arcade. But That's okay. It all, you know, all these different initiatives work together. Exactly. Because some of the, the businesses, the retail businesses in this building have benefited from that first floor fund. Uh-huh. And you asked earlier, and I never answered, you know, about the different capital stack, the the different uh, elements that make a project like this come together. Well, the first thing you need is people, right? The second thing you need is passion. And then all the rest of it's easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> easy. <laughs> 10, 11 years yeah. worth of easy. Yeah. But if you don't have people, the if you don't have people and you don't have passion, you're never going to be able to take the next step. 
So, so let's take a step back on that and, uh, and let's just talk about that for a I only minutes. like to go forward, but okay. <sighs> but up, up. Okay. <laughs> I try. <laughs> um, so now you got me all derailed because you, if you were so clever, <laughs> like, whoa, squirrel. Um, so there's, there's two points here that, that I think we definitely, that I want to kind of dig into a little bit. One is kind of the question of, Technically, what are the pieces that need to be put together? Yeah. So I often tell folks that doing, especially doing a big project like this, it's not a case of one funding <laughs> set. It's a layer. So you've got a layer. You've got one layer that is what the property is able to generate. Yeah. Just standard. If you can rent it, what can you yeah. rent it or, or I? Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. Then you've got. But you've also then got what it's going to cost to do this this property. Like what what is the amount of work that it needs? And especially in older buildings and in downtown buildings, there's often a very big gap between what the building needs done and what the market can support. Because if yeah. it was the same, then it would have been done already. Right. If it were easy, it would be done. I say that a lot just because, <laughs> you know. Either I got that from you or you got that from me. Maybe, I, the, yeah, we yeah. Was, I know I've been saying that a long time, too. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of pieces that have to go in between in order to get that to work. And you've mentioned Cross Street Partners, which is a great national right. multi. They take on insanely complex projects. Sure. that mostly involve historic buildings and big historic buildings and difficult to reuse, et cetera, et cetera. So what were kind of the primary pieces that had to go in place in order for that, in order for this, this to be feasible? So I, all the, you know, again, there's so many parts and pieces. I'm not going to do all of them justice, but I'll try to hit uh, you know, some of the high notes of the partners that came together to make this work so far. I mean, it's, again, we're still working. Still in, we're still, still in, yeah. in construction, although that, you know, that generated even new partners. Uh, but, uh, you know, the main development team is was Cross Street Partners. They brought McCormick, Byron, Salazar, mm -hmm. um, and their expertise related to multifamily housing okay. uh, to the to the project. Uh, structural Technologies, I don't exactly know where they're based. I think they're also in the Baltimore area, like Cross Street. Mm -hmm. But because of the construction type, the age of construction, and understanding how these buildings were interconnected, that engineering background was pivotal for this project, just to yeah. make sure that nothing, uh, no building was damaged because of you know, yeah. making your own choices. Of you can't just gonna... blow a hole right. through the you, side of the... Of... You have to do that with information and with data. So those were the original partners, but there was also a group called the Friends of the Arcade. Oh. And the Friends of the Arcade were talking, continued to talk about the arcade even when it was dormant. And these oh. are quiet doers of Dayton that okay. uh, were spreading the, the message of how great the arcade is. And we can't lose this treasure that sits in the heart of the Gem City. So they were the advocate. They were the local advocate. So this isn't just a matter of bringing, bringing big right. guns from elsewhere. You needed to have the local advocates, right? And and they they're still here. They're still in the building. And you know, just like all of us, they're getting older as well. But we've gotten this to a point where we now have the next generation of people, you know, uh, pounding their chest about how great this building is, and we can't lose it. We don't build buildings like this anymore. Um, so that uh, advocacy work that they did you know, over the decades is really paying off, especially as we introduce a next generation of people to the to this building and the, and the structures that make up uh, the complex. But the different capital stacks, again, not with, without getting into too much detail, there's uh, new market tax credits in okay. this project. Uh, there's historic preservation tax credits. Okay. Uh, there were a lot of uh, attorneys involved. Uh, a lot of, of which is necessary uh, to yeah, do those tax well, credits. Necessary, and then because of all, there's different easements. Because uh, I, again, I, as a planner, I don't want to get into too much detail. But from Third Street, which is to the north of where we're sitting right uh -huh. now, and then Fourth Street to the south, there's a public way that goes uh, between those two experiences. It's a pedestrian path, 
Now, it doesn't read like a road, but uh -huh. it's it not just something you can transfer in a legal, uh, you know, in a, in a usual and customary uh, real estate transaction. So there's a lot of different uh, oh, nuances wow. to it uh, that all had to be figured out. So again, you don't take, uh, you have to be a tenacious developer with a decent attention span to be able to <laughs> work through the different, me the myriads of, of le uh, layers that go into a development like this. And just like normal everyday people, not all developers are willing to, uh, you know, go through all of that, bring that tenacity to the table. Oh, for sure. And that's why I think they, the partnership originally emerged between, you know, some of the ones that I talked about is like, okay, you have model group that obviously has done a lot of work in Cincinnati and done a lot of historic preservation work. Yeah. So had a knowledge of how uh, Ohio preservation tax credits work and work continue to work. And then, um, you know, the other the other partners involved too each bring different skill set yeah. so that it's the collective of yeah. that group together. It's under the leadership of Cross Street. Right. But, uh, you know, I don't want to discount the, the role that the city played in this because certainly we're not a developer. We want to see development mm -hmm. happen, mm -hmm. but we're not a developer. But we're steadfast in our uh once the community made the decision that this building should be should be saved, you know, we we wanted to work with the developer to make that happen. And, uh, and I, you know, that, that yeah. that's that's meaningful to to me as a as a member of this community uh, and as a Daytonian, but also a, a, as a, as an employee of the city of Dayton. It's important as well. Absolutely. I want to come back to that question of the city's role. Uh, but first, let's just make, try to make this stack a little bit clear. Mm -hmm. So there was some income that could be expected from the various buildings mm -hmm. if they're developed in this, that, or another manner. Yeah. So, for example, the hotel mm -hmm. that is under construction right now, there's enough knowledge of the market to say, okay, there's going to be demand for right. at least we hope so. Yeah. Um, but it's it's pretty well informed. Nobody's just taking a flyer. Nobody here. nobody is is no bank is loaning money on hotels unless you have an ironclad market. Stand. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So so there's money that can be expected and that can be leveraged into a, a conventional commercial loan. There, but that's not enough to do this right. whole project. There and and that's true for the apartments because apartment demand is very high mm -hmm. in city of Dayton. Um, that's true for the hotel. Um, then you've got these two tax credits that you described, the new market tax credit and the historic tax credit. Mm -hmm. And there's actually two different historic tax there's credits. Pace financing too. I forgot about Pace. Okay. So there's, and that's the, the environmental. Yep. Yeah, property okay. assess clean energy. Okay. Uh, so there's a clean energy tax credit. There's, yeah. there's a variety of tax credits and basically the developers can either take that tax credit as a as basically use it against their own taxes or they can sell those tax credits to another to it's, somebody else yeah, that will to use monetize it. that yeah right to, they can yeah. they can basically treat it as something yeah, and i don't sell. know this you know enough about the structure to know if it was used by sure. partners or, or not and that's the but the fact that they were able to leverage those mm -hmm. tools is what it, what is important what was important to get this going and then yeah on the sustainability uh, side Obviously, uh, I, it might not be uh, obvious to people, but this uh, b whole complex of building operates on geothermal. Oh, wow. So it, it's really a, a case study <laughs> for a, a lot half of a different... million, Half a million square feet mm -hmm. geothermal. Yes. Wow. That's a whole nother. Yeah, that's a story I, I, for another that, day. That's, yeah, that's a whole, you know, basement tour. Wow. So, so. Yeah, Dave, Dave Williams from Cross Street is a very huge proponent of geothermal. And he got the other uh, part of the development team really uh, mm -hmm. understanding the aquifer that Dayton sits on and then the benefit of using oh, it wow. to, uh, you know, create okay. this utility for this building. So awesome. Anyway, that's, awesome. That, that's a like I said, a case study with Dave on that would be that's fa cool. a fabulous, fabulous that is so uh, cool. investment of time. So. Yeah. And then you had the various partners who committed to, yes, I will lease the property. I will lease this part for this many years, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. 
So the last thing I wanted to ask you about, uh-huh. you've been so generous. I've been watching you for 20 years. I know how much well, more than that. that long. Oh, no, no. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> but you've been such an advocate, such a supporter, such a tenacious is a word that I would apply to you mm-hmm. as well, Madam Walbridge. Yeah. You've been nothing but tenacious when it comes to this and all of the rest of the work that you're doing mm-hmm. in the city of Dayton. And we've talked about partnerships and how important partnerships are. And the city very often wants to kind of downplay its role. Like the city very, and, and Dayton's not unique in this, yeah. sorry. Uh-huh. But the people who work for city will always be the first to say, well, it's a partnership and we worked with so-and-so and, and downplay its own role. Sure. To the point where somebody like Brad Feld, the you know startup guru, says that startup communities cannot be led by a city. They, that the city has to be a feeder to a startup community and not a leader. And I've struggled with that Mm -hmm. on and off over the last many years. In this case, the city, you're downplaying the city's role. The city played a really, some really, really crucial roles in this process, even if it wasn't shelling out, you know, big bucks the whole way through, which the city didn't have. Tell me about what the city's role in this whole process of getting this complex, this 11 buildings, this half million square feet with this exceptionally unusual, giant open space in the middle of it. What role did the city play? Well, I think, well, they played many roles, all of them important but none of them would have happened without interest from the development community. So I am one that downplays our role a lot because you, nobody works alone. And if you work alone, you're only successful for yourself. You're not successful for your community. And I think That's I, gospel I, truth. I, I and my colleagues really want this, you know, investments to be get more investments in our community and what, not just investment for the sake of investment, but investments that are meaningful to people's lives and build uh, assets in our community, people assets and place assets. I think from before 20, we'll go before 2019, really it was the exploration of the disinvestment that had happened in these complex of buildings. Uh, the fact that, you know, this is third and main outside this door. I refer to it as main and main. This is the center of the Dayton region where mm-hmm. we're sitting right now. Mm -hmm. And if the center of the Dayton region is vacant, scary, unattractive, boarded up. And it was all of those things. What is that? What kind of output does that give out to the rest of the region? So I think the city's role initially was listening to the community about, well, what do you want to happen here? Because there was an outcry of it all needs to be torn down. Mm. But you have to be able to to counter that with data. Okay, well, how much is it going to cost to tear down 500,000, you know, 500,000 square feet of built environment? And then what are you left with? What's the value of those things? Versus Mm -hmm. if we rehab them, we're not spending money on demolition. How can you leverage that money into the environment, built environment that exists here to elevate it to, you know, 2024, you know, into the next century yeah. uh, of uses. Um, so that was that was the conversation that, you know, that was really uh, stoked by the city and bringing the community around so that, because it's easy for people to say, oh yeah, just tear it down without thinking about who's going to write that check. And that's an incredibly important point. Yeah. And so the city's role in taking that conversation forward and putting that information out there and say it, it, it this is not a like, place. Yeah, like, yeah, it, it wasn't in a you know that it, that kind of way. It was more <laughs> like okay, because yeah, you know again, it's easy for people to uh, you know develop from an easy chair. You know, all of it's easy until you try to do it. Yeah, it's like oh, well, all you got to do is this, this, and this. Well, not having no real yeah. idea what what that takes. Yeah, and and everybody has to have their first project. So I'm okay with with the learning aspect of that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it, it so us. Uh, the the organization facilitating that conversation and bringing those data points forward was important to widen people's eyes because 
again, if it went to the landfill, then you lost what could be leveraged through the historic preservation tax credit mm -hmm. program. And we've already, you know, as you walk around the building, you'll already be able to see. We don't build buildings like this. You yep. see some of the cornice work uh, and the, the cornucopias that are on the walls in the arcade. Mm -hmm. If we did that now, it would be done in foam. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't it's, last as long. Yeah, it wouldn't and, look as good. You know, these are, it's just not, it's just not built like, like this anymore. And, and not to take anything away from new buildings, but this was built in a certain time. And yeah. keeping it here really represents, especially the, the innovation of Dayton. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think about what was happening in the early 1900s. Oh, yeah. Uh, with cars and uh, the electric car starter and, uh, you know, the deeds of the world, uh, the Pattersons of the world. Uh, all yeah, the, huge amount, yeah, of huge innovation, amount of innovation, innovation coming out like, of this city. Yeah, and and it'd be like, oh, n none of that matters. Let's just wipe this clean. And yeah, again, that was a decision that the community got to. Okay, how long did that take? How long were those conversations? Now it seems like a minute ago. A minute, but, <laughs> you know. Again, it, it, it was. I would say at least eighteen months. It might even been longer. You kind of lose track, right? Uh, but it was not a one shot. Oh no, it wasn't one meeting. <laughs> it was not a one meeting. Yeah, and there was a lot of of uh, data collected uh, again because uh, people say things, and it's not like you want to go get them. But it's like, okay, you say that, but what does that really mean? And well, what does that mean? And how do you quantify that? So there was a lot of quantification mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. with you know engineering studies and and data points that were collected to tell yeah. uh, lay out what the future of this building could be so it was the communication but it was also a two-way street sure kind of communication so so the city is bringing forward the factual information but the city is also facilitating that ongoing conversation for sure because we're not experts in any of those any of the areas that were studied but we also recognize that having information uh, broad information and vast information, mm -hmm. uh, you need good data to make good decisions. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. It, you know, that I think that, and again, nobody cares about that stuff after uh -huh. a project gets going or a project dies, but you are right. It is foundational. In and because it's foundational, it gets overlooked. It, yeah, it does. So, so being able to, de to have that information and to be able to demonstrate that community support. Mm -hmm. And we don't mean everybody and their mother throughout the entire city, but enough community support, enough people saying we want this to happen, that then gave an opportunity to share information with potential developers mm -hmm. and say, here is the opportunity. Yeah. Is that how that unfolded? No, it, it was a little bit different. That uh, Cross Street was kind of out there, uh -huh. uh, interested in the project, and we weren't the property owner. So Again, if we were that property owner, it probably would, it could have been handled differently, could have been. but it was really about getting, having a community decision so that you're not working then at cross purposes mm -hmm. when somebody says, yes, so I that, want to be involved in this and I'm, I'm really willing to, you know, put equity in and do different. So the exist, the, the property owners had to be part of this. They had to very actively be part of this agreement as, as well. well. Yes. Uh -huh. And sometimes bringing them around. Takes a while. Yeah. You need those numbers to show them. Just, uh, okay, yeah. now this, I think this makes sense. Yeah. And you need the county, you know, again, you have tax, there's tax liabilities, tax obligations that are, you know, uh -huh. were happening and not happening as the case may be. Uh, and all that, you know, played into, you know, getting this community to that moment in time when they decided this is a treasure and we're not losing. It. And that's, that is what has very clearly happened. This is the treasure and, they ain't gonna lose it right so all right that's perfect thank you so sure. much i really appreciate you yeah. taking the time so last thing i want to ask you and you've been a daytonian yourself for many 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 years i'm not going to do that math again <laughs> uh, uh you raised two kids here two two boys who kick butt and you're as embedded in this community as anybody. So put your city hat aside for a minute. What do you, Amy, what do you want to see for the future of this community? 10 years, 20 years, 
put the time frame where you want. Where do you yourself hope to see this community be in the future? That's an interesting and hard question at the same time. You know, I, I've lived in Dayton since 1988. Right, oh, after, you did the math. Yeah, I All did right. the math. No, I, I know when I moved here. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, my husband's not from here. I'm not from here, but we love it here. We are really invested here mm. in, in ways that go beyond just where we hang out. It's where we have invested and what uh, causes we've gotten behind financially uh, near to where we're sitting just a little bit to the south is Levitt Pavilion. Mm -hmm. That's an outdoor music pavilion that's free. Well, it's not free because it's free. It's free because there's donors and a community that wants to have arts and music available to everyone where you don't have to have a ticket and you don't have to have, you don't have to know anybody. You just show up with your lawn chair and sit there. Yeah. When Dayton got Levitt, it was like a turning point for me personally oh, wow. because I've seen the power of music with people. It's like a universal language. So experiences and building a sense of place like Levitt did, more of those experiences, not music experiences, but other experiences that bring people together is is what I want uh, as a Daytonian, as Amy Walbridge, citizen of the world, uh, citizen of Dayton, is for more experiences and more for more social interaction because I really believe in my heart that we're all better when we are all better. And that means we have to get together in order to be better. We can't just talk about uh, people on the East or people in the South or, you know, it's, we're one day. We're not that big of a community and us be leaning in and, and wanting to be better together is really you know, what I want. So a specific, what is it? I don't know, but it's, it's places and experiences that we can have as humankind that I want. Wonderful. Wonderful. And humankind together. Yep. Not just in a little neighborhood. Right. Awesome. Wonderful. Thanks a ton, Amy. Mm-hmm. Thank sure. you. 